I tend to have a lot stronger of a closing speed in practice. And so normally I have it in the bag, but I was so excited that I went out so fast in the mile that your girl had nothing left towards the end. <laughs> I really gave an arm, a leg, and everything for, for that race. So, um, so I did not see her coming, but looking at the footage afterwards, I was like, oh my God, that was close. That was freaking close. Yeah, yeah. Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We've got a full crew tonight. Meg Armitage, Luke Paddington, and a new Olympian, Erica Sullivan. What's up, hey. <laughs> Shoot, way to go. Look at you. Uh, coming off trials, initial thoughts. What's going on? A lot of, like, shock. Like, it hasn't fully sunk in yet, and I don't think it will sink in until I'm at camp. But it's been crazy. And it's it's weird because like nothing at home has changed, which is like as it should be. So it's just like, yeah, back to back to normal. And it's like my mom is like, we're going like you're going to the Olympics in a month. I'm like, huh. Weird. Like weird. It's you're in a press conference, you're in the news, you're in a newspaper. Your life has changed. Yeah, which is bizarre. Cause yeah. it's like literally like I'm the person who just like stays at home and watches movies like all the time. And just like watches TV shows. Like I'm a film major, so I love movies. And so I literally just like sit in my home and watch movies. And then like, yeah, like I'll be doing like press conferences and like media. And I'm like, huh. Well, it's funny because even with the press, I'm like, what's I was like talking to them about like directors and filmmaking and stuff like that. And they're like, they were like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking about Quentin Tarantino with an Olympian. I'm like, I can't believe I'm an Olympian talking about Quentin Tarantino. Like <laughs> it's weird. What's your favorite yeah. sports film or Olympics film or anything? Ooh. Okay. Let me hear you. Film, it's probably like the most uncommon sports film ever, but it's a synchronized swimming film and it's directed by Celine Scamina and it's called Water Lilies and it's in French. Whoa. And now it is, I gotta watch this. It is very, it's very gay yeah. and it's glorious. Well, I think. Do you guys know what Letterboxd is? Yeah. Okay, so Letterboxd is like a place where you log movies. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure my review for that movie was like, if I knew how gay synchronized swimming was, I would have taken my swim career another direction. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, didn't know that. I didn't know that about Synchro. Yeah, I didn't either. I was in for a loop. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So do you feel like the buzz has has come down some or are you still buzzing from trials? Uh, I think the buzz has come down. And in terms of my body, I think the buzz has also come down. I came down with a really bad cold two days ago and I literally think it's from me not sleeping for like a week straight. <laughs> and so my body has felt the grunt of it. I'm getting over it pretty quick. But um, yeah, it was. it's definitely coming down and I think it's for the better because – like I said, I sit at home and watch movies all day long. I'm not, I do not deal with a lot of, like, okay, so I want to go into directing because I hate to be in front of the camera. I love to be behind the camera, behind the scenes, creating. I hate to be in front of it. And I feel like when right. you're in, you, they put you in front of the camera. Yeah. So it's been very shocking to say the least. <laughs> when did you know you became an Olympian was it during the race where or when you saw somebody catch you not when you touched the wall when did you realize okay this is it for sure like were you like are you sure am I yet because they didn't put your rings next to your name until yeah yeah until a few days later that's yeah. when I announced onto the team well I have a thing because in junior worlds a few years ago I was really hoping to medal third and I had around 150 left and I was like, yes, I'm going to medal. <laughs> and someone passed me with 150 to go in a mile, which honestly it sucks. It's one of the worst things ever. And um, so when I was coming in second for the mile, I was not letting myself be like, okay, yeah. you got this until I touched the wall. So when I touched, um, I figured I was going to be on the team just because mm. it was kind of in the beginning of the meet and I thought that there would be enough doubles but now looking back and seeing the team as a whole and realizing that there weren't as many doubles as expected and unfortunately Ryan Hell didn't even get a spot because there weren't right. enough doubles like 
it's definitely shocking to say the least. And I'm like, oh my God, I really, really pushed my luck there. So like, thank God. But yeah, when I finally got the box and it was like officially announced that I got my invite to Tokyo, it was really exciting. Did, did did you see Katie coming down on you? And did you say, what are you doing, girl? Back off. What's that last 29, that 50? Yeah. What are you doing? What's going on? Yeah, I didn't even see her. Huh? And um, it's crazy because at practice every day, we tend to work on our back half. We tend to work on our closing speed. And in terms of practice, like out of the girls, I tend to have a lot stronger of a closing speed in practice. And so normally I have it in the bag, but I was so excited that I went out so fast in the mile that your girl had nothing left towards the end. <laughs> I really gave an arm, a leg, and everything for, for that race. <laughs> So, um, so I did not see her coming, but looking at the footage afterwards, I was like, oh my God, that was close. That was freaking close. Yeah, yeah. At that point, is that, that like you, sorry, go ahead. Is that like your usual race strategy then? Would you like not pay attention, not pay attention, but like not look at the other competitors or do you like just go straight in for your own race? I, I'm normally really good about seeing the rest of the field because of open water. And I really am like instinctive and strategic and figuring it out. But I was really nervous before this one. And Ron was like, I realized how nervous you were when you were like silent. And I'm usually a very chatty person. Mm. And so he's like, that's when I knew you were like nervous. And uh, I was just like so antsy and so ready to go that the minute I dove in, I just, I flew and I went for it. And the last 600 felt like a kettlebell fell on my back. <laughs> let's uh, talk about the mile. Let, 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 let's talk about equality in sport with the mile. Um, I, I didn't realize that the miles were one of the original events in swimming. In fact, the very first Olympic Games, there was a 1,200 meter. And the second Olympic Games, there's a 4,000 meter. And then they figured out, okay, let's just do the 1,500. But that was never for mm. women. I mean, women weren't allowed to swim until much later on anyway, far less swim long distance events. What was that like for you um, being the second U.S. woman to ever compete at the Olympics for in the mile now? Yeah, it's yeah. it's awesome and it's definitely a step in the right direction. I mean, I think this is something that we have been wanting for a really long time and honestly, I think one of the reasons why they decided to bring it in is a lot of it is Katie. They wanted to see Katie in more events and sure. this was an opportunity to do that. And so honestly, like she is huge for the sport in that sense and I think I honestly just came into distance swimming at the right time to where I was able to you know, try to make it a goal of mine to make it in that event. But I'm excited. And internationally, distance girls is a pretty good group of us. And it'll be mm -hmm. fun. It'll be fun for sure. I mean, that's very humble. You're the second fastest short horse yards miler ever. ever. So <laughs> <laughs> to say that it's just a timing thing is is probably not being fair to yourself. But, uh, you know, I, I think I'm I'm a sprinter. And, um, and so is Luke, um, not Meg. But my my best event ended up being the 50 fly and you know at the time of the peak of my career the u.s didn't even swim the 50 of stroke at uh, our world trials meet let alone you know um take anybody on the team they'd always pulled somebody else from the team so i didn't even get to go but those events aren't in the olympics either yet they're on the world championship schedule mm -hmm. all along i still have always thought no first they need to make the 1500 and the 800 fair and I have to say, I'm pretty pleased that, like, you know, the IOC has taken that step, the right step, when they could have easily said no, like ISL, sprinting, everybody cares about the short distance, that's where the eyeballs are, and yet distance is back. <laughs> like, it's it really, I mean, it seems like distance was dying, and if you look at the ISL, it seems like distance is dying, but clearly it's not. No, for sure, and honestly... I'm kind of pleased with the way the ISL is even taking steps to add distance swimming because they're, they're trying to find ways to add the 800. And like, honestly, it's like for such a high energy climate, like ISL, I never expected to even go into ISL or have it be an option just because it was like peaked at 400. And honestly, I was okay with that. I was just like, eh, I really don't need ISL anyway, but the fact that they're expanding is great. And maybe, you know, I have a chance in the future to represent ISL, ISL teams. Heck yeah. yeah. Well, you, I want to get to the next step for you, which is, which is college after the Olympics. But, um, 
first, I really want to know. So when we go back to um, the 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 period, you know, during the meet and trials, all, whether or not um, there was going to be uh, enough doubles to select the second place competitors on the team, from my recollection, has never been part of the discussion ever. Um, yes, it was always true, but during trials, beforehand, during. No one was ever talking about it. It was just always assumed that it was going to happen and that when you got second place, you expected to make the team. Nope. This was the first sure. time, like from, from our side, watching trials and, and keeping up with it, there was a lot of commentary about oh, such and so is likely to make the team. And I don't ever remember that happening. But as an athlete, what, like were, were the swimmers aware of that and thinking that too during the meet? I mean, I think we're trying to think in terms of like best case scenario where it's like, yeah, I did number two. So I hope that's enough. And I can't really testify for 2016 because I was in the venue watching as well. But 2012, 2008, I believe, even if you were second place, didn't they show the rings on the screen when you touch? They did, right? Oh, yeah. And this time they didn't. They only showed the top spot. So I think, I mean, like you can't help but be a little nervous. Yeah. At, in those situations but um yeah i think i mean i think we could all testify because at the end of the day i am a swimming fan first before a swimmer like i love i love you know reading about me going on and i think it was and i had my own predictions going into the meet of who was going to make it on the team and i think me and a lot of swim fans everywhere were kind of shocked at how the team ended up turning out like i think we've i think we all have some like clear upsets that we were like horribly wrong about with our predictions and so yeah more so the fact that it was like number two might make it on the team it was more shocking of like oh my god I can't believe so and so missed the team that was more shocking for us which one's the biggest shock to you from trials a huge one for me was funny enough I was in the ready room right before the 1500 and all of us are in the room and we're all watching on the screen. So it's like uh there's like eight chairs lined up in a row because they're ready to stage us. And we see Madison Cox and she looked like she had it in the bag for the 200 IM. And then even on the last 25, she looked good. And then she touched and I, we saw Douglas and we were all like, oh my God. Like yeah. that, the ready room was just like gasps, which is honestly kind of cool. It's, it's cool when you see swimmers really enjoy swimming. And that was one of the races where you just saw all of us be like, wow, like we just saw something, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, it's a Reagan two back. Um, but I mean, she was still on the team, right? But um, yeah. but that, I don't know, that, that was kind of the shock of the meet to me for her not to make it in the two back. That was yeah. shocking too. That was also in the ready room for the eight free. That was... All, all the big ones, I was in the ready room. But, yeah, Reagan's was shocking. And funny enough, that night I was able to hang out with her. And we we talked about how, you know, she wasn't fully satisfied with her two back. I wasn't fully satisfied with my eight free. And we're going to be roommates in Hawaii and Japan. So mm-hmm. we were just sitting there and we were just like, it's so, we, were, we were trying to comfort each other a little bit. So that was awesome. Well, so tell me about like what's coming next. So obviously you guys have already started to formulate a team and, and get roommates. How, how did that go? Did you guys get to choose who you're rooming with? Is that random? Like what's, what, what are you hearing from USA swimming and like, what are they prepping you for? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not forced where it's like you have to find a roommate cause then it gets kind of clicky, but it's like, mm-hmm. if you have someone you work well with, let us know kind of thing. And um, I've known Regan. I met her at the junior world trip in 2017 <clears throat> And we were roommates in 2018 Pan Packs. And we've just really, our friendship has been great to where we hit it off the bat really, really well. Um, in Junior Worlds, Regan had a stacked schedule and I only had the 1500. And she was snacking on an apple between our races. And she's like, Erica, I need you to hold this apple. And I was like, yeah, of course. So I hold it for her and she forgets about the apple. And I held on to this apple for like two hours. <laughs> so that was the beginning of a blossoming friendship. And uh after worlds well funny enough we booked it right before worlds but we planned to have a little vacation where i'd go to minnesota and spend time with her and her family so we've developed a really close bond over the years so we got to we got to pick and it was no question we were going to room together in hawaii and japan but in terms of communication it's been a lot of zoom meetings and a lot of group chats where 
we're trying to listen to the few veterans that are have already been on the team before. They've been really giving us advice of like how to pack and what to bring mm-hmm. and what we need and stuff like that. So that's been helpful. I feel like in in the COVID situation as well, like having like Reagan there and like someone that you know so well, it's just such like a blessing, like in disguise, like especially because there's like nobody there now. Like, well, I can't remember how many spectators they're, they're allowing now in Japan, but the fact that you'll have someone there, especially you can just go back to the room and chat about it, it's just so much nicer. It'll be fun. And the fact that it's like a lot of the times you don't even talk about like swim, mm. like we just talk about like stupid things. I think it'll be really, really good for us there. I think I think yeah. we're gonna agree to room with you because you have the inside in Japan. You're gonna know, it's, know you know the language. You can have family there. You're gonna know the food. You're the insider. It's going home for you almost, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's literally my second home, and I love it there. And I found that in recent years, I tend to identify with my Japanese side more than my American side. Mm-hmm. But um, so I'm really excited. But yeah, Regan, we had a lot of fun in Pan Packs in 2018 when we went to Japan. <laughs> So I'm excited to go back and it'll be fun with Regan and we'll have a good time for sure. I wonder if the Japanese public knows uh, about your, your heritage. Um, but that that's, that's a big thing. I mean, I, I assume that you're the only member of the U S uh, swim delegation who is fluent in Japanese. I'm actually not. You're not who we have Jay Liverman. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah, okay. Of course. Yeah. My mom loves the Litherlands. My mom said <laughs> they are so cute. They all like talk to her in Japanese and she is in love with them. Well, let's talk about representing that community. We just had yeah. Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander Month, Heritage Month last month, I think it was. And it's, I mean, we've had a, a, a terrible spot of Asian hate in, in America. Let's talk about the importance of representing that and making them have pr- pride in their community and, and what you're going to show for the US. Yeah, I'm excited, especially since. I am very white passing. I have the the fortune of being white passing. So like when mm. API hate was really bad, I was never worried for myself, but I was very worried for my mom and my little sister because they mm. my little sister is a lot more Asian passing than I am. And my mom is full Asian. She's not even a citizen. She's here on a green card. So um, which funny enough means that she can go to the games or we're going to try to get her to go to the games, oh. which is exciting. Oh, cool. But cool. um yeah, no, it's a great community to represent. I think it's one of those things where no one understands what it's like because I feel like bento boxes and like boba and sushi are now kind of like trendy, so to speak. Yeah. But then when I had bento boxes in elementary school, oh my God, I got bullied. I was picked on every single day. They did not like rice balls. They did not like seaweed. So I think we all have shared experiences in that sense where it's just like, oh, so they get it. They get it. So Honestly, I'm really excited to be that representation for that community. And I like, I honestly, when people slide into my DMs with that kind of stuff, I like talking to them about it because it's so interesting. And it's like every perspective is different, but it's also all the same. So it's it's like, it's so cool. I love it. What do you think about your position in the sport now and the platform that this gives you with your success to, you know, be an advocate and be a role model and somebody for the Asian American community? Um, It's pretty good. I honestly think it's like, yes, a lot of the, the Asian community reaches out to me. But like I said, a lot of people don't originally know because I am, I look very white. But I know a lot of people see find me through the queer community first. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, she's Asian American too. So it becomes kind of umbrella, like umbrella mm-hmm. representing with the queer community and the Asian American community. It's like a little double combo. I was going to ask you the same question for the queer community. I can't think of a, another swimmer to represent the US who was open, who was, who, who was, who was open about um, their sexuality. I mean, a lot have come out afterwards, they're, they're after they retired, um, but not many. So as far as I knew, I, I don't think of any. And, and that that's... I, I heard the same thing. It, I yeah, yeah, surely. I mean, and there's a Canadian, um, Marcus Tomaya has come out and he's doing really good stuff in Canada. He just qualified for the Canadian. But for the US team, I don't know. And I, Eric, believe, what? I believe I believe Abram Devine. Is no, but he didn't make the US Olympic team. Oh, I thought you just said on the team in general. No, yeah, yeah to, to represent the US at the Olympic Games, at to be Olympic, on NBC... Right to be on the Bob Costa thing. I mean, it's yeah, 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 yeah. so talk about how liberating that is, but also that's surely a lot of burden as well. Yeah, honestly, it's one of those things that I didn't know I was getting myself into. Mm-hmm. So 
everyone asks, it's like, how did you have the strength to come out and all these things? And it's honestly like, uh, I didn't. So basically what happened was uh, the closet for me was glass. Everyone knew I was gay before I knew I was gay. I mean, like, look at the posters in the background. <laughs> <laughs> everyone knew. And when I came out, I was when people started to realize that I liked girls, I wasn't even on the national team, mm -hmm. like was not in that position at all. So basically I kind of just came out for me, for my inner circle. And so people would know, and then the swimming thing kind of took off. And so then I was kind of put in a position of being a role model, so to speak. And honestly, everyone in my life has been supportive. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And I've never been faced with anything terribly from it, except like, a few homophobic comments on the USA Swimming Instagram page every fr every Pride Month, so it's never been like horrible. But and at the end of the day, like I know that those people really have no effect on my life because I'm happy and um, I'm living my best life out here. But yeah, it's weird because I never thought I'd become a role model, and the fact that people DM me on Instagram and are like, "You inspired me to come out." I'm like, "Wow!" Like I'm just I'm just doing me. So like that's amazing kudos to you it's rarely it's really crazy what well, why do you think there's still a huge fear for a lot of people to stay in the closet and what do you think you can use as your platform to to advise them even though you do it passively you know by your exemplary attitude yeah yeah i think there was a stereotype at least when i came out there was a stereotype that it was like when you were closeted you kept that side of you ex excluded from the world for so long that it was like when you came out, you decided to like experiment and try to find out more about yourself. So then it was like, you didn't have the commitment to swim anymore. That was kind of the stereotype. So everyone was like, oh, you get slower. But like I said, I'm quite a bit of a homebody. So like that never really bothered me. At least that's the, that was the reputation that I was walking into. Like people wow. yeah. told me that it was like, you know, if you come out, like, you tend to plot like you tend to plateau because you're just figuring you have a lot of things to figure out and so i think that might be the reason why a lot of people tend to not come out and also i feel like swimming is such a big uh locker room sport where a lot of us are in locker rooms and we're in bathing suits and it's it's very it's very like it's a serious topic and i feel like when you're gay you start to face a lot of negative connotation and mm -hmm. you're position where you could get targeted by the wrong people and i think that's another reason why a lot of people tend to shy away from it too what advice could you give them or what what what, what have you learned and you know you've struggled a lot but you've gained strength in the struggles what, what yeah. you, um honestly it's just like stay clear to your roots like i yeah. mean i'm very fortunate that my family knew and they loved me for who i was and all my friends love me for it and they're all very gung-ho about it and they love it but um no, for sure. It's just like, make sure you're safe first and mm -hmm. make sure you have a community that loves you because if your friend group is not supportive of it, find new friends. That's like the best thing I can tell you because I believe, uh, what's his name? Carl something, the Raiders football guy who just came yeah. out. Yeah. He just released a quote that it was like, if one adult is supportive of your sexuality, it decreases the chance that an LGBT is going to commit suicide by 40%. Mm -hmm. which is wow. which is wow. that so it's just like if you're in a position where no one around you is accepting you find someone who will because it makes it so much better and it's like i'm very lucky that i have a community that supports me and if someone online needs a supporting person in their life i will gladly be that person so yeah i just want to make it clear that it's like it sucks when you're going through it it really sucks and you're really confused but the squad on the other side is a great one and i would not I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, mental depression in swimming is is so underspoken. Um, I'm, I'm not just talking to the elite level. We've had so many guests on our show have, have <laughs> talked about it, and that's just the elites. It's it's rampant. Far less those who are added by quietly struggling with sexuality behind closed doors and and, and suffering. Um, you know, we need to address this more. Now, USA Swimming is doing a really good job at it, but I still think it needs to do more and needs to do more openness and straight up talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe expressing yourself in film. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I'd love to make some projects about it. But my mental illness was honestly from a lot of things happening at once. Like my dad died. I was in the closet trying to figure myself out. Um, 
I was literally having an identity cli- identity crisis where I was going to college and I didn't really know what was going on and swimming was happening. Mm-hmm. So my mental illness was depression, anxiety, but it was more so trauma related. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's something that a lot of people need to talk about. I don't think people understand like swimming is a sport where your head is in the water and it is just you and your thoughts for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's why it's so bad with athletes because mm-hmm. like, yeah, your football players have it, but you have a way to vocalize your emotions on the field. You know what I mean? Like swimming your face, you're literally staring at a black line. And when you're, when your inner thoughts are bad, it is very easy for it to spin out of control. And I do think USA swimming is doing a great job at giving us the means of getting help. Like they actually connected me with my therapist here, Yeah. but uh, yeah, there are better steps. And honestly, the way they try to normalize it now is kind of just like, bringing it up into like meetings and stuff like that, where we're not fully paying attention. I think they could do better by having the athletes who struggled with it be like, Hey, I get it. It happens. And honestly, with Allison Schmidt being on the team this year, oops. I don't know if you guys heard that. Let me mute that real quick, but that's all right. Uh, yeah. Honestly, with uh, Allison Schmidt being on the team this year, I think that it's huge. Um, it's huge. And I do mm-hmm. think she will be a good, yeah. um, representation of people who struggle with the post-Olympic depression too. I honestly, I think she's going to get captain this year. There's no doubt about it. Her, her comeback and what Tom did after his two fly disaster. And I didn't think <coughs> I saw Tom on the blogs before they hunt the one fly. He was literally doing what he talked about in the show, just talking to himself, using his positive ways of, of rear you know, what he worked with his therapist on talking to himself, talking to himself. And he just turned around his swims and that one fly was back to like his best time almost. Um, yeah. Tom talks about it being straight up, you know, I committed suicide. I tried to commit suicide in 2018. And this is what I do about it. And it wasn't for my wife. It wasn't for this. It wasn't for that. And we need to be as blunt as that sometimes. Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, and scary yeah. as hell. Yeah, it kind of sucks that there's this, like, stereotype of suicide where people think it's, like, selfish. Right. But I don't think people really understand that when you're at that point, it's more so, like, you genuinely think you're an inconvenience to everyone around you. And that is a horrible thought process to have, but that's literally what depression is. And yeah, they do need to change. We need to change that narrative to be like, if you are struggling with those thoughts, like you need to get help. And honestly, Tom has done a good job at that. So many people have done a great job. Allison has done a great job at it. And it's, it's moving in the right direction. Michael's a very good advocate about it as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned like, obviously working with a therapist and obviously like Tom saying that he's worked with her and all these athletes come forward. What else like, do you find really helped you or helped you slash does now with like dealing with like those like bouts of depression and like mental health? And what do you think like would help like other swimmers as well? Especially if like maybe if people can't like afford a therapist or something. Yeah, I totally get it. Uh, for me, so my therapist told me not to do it right off the bat, but it really tended to help me in the grand scheme of things. But journaling, I'm a big journaler mm-hmm. just you know, liking films and writing screenplays and stuff like that. I found that writing is very therapeutic Mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sometimes it was just like a brain dump. It was just like word vomit of something I needed to get off my chest. And I would write and write and write and write until I felt better. And um, in the moment, it was not good things I was writing about. But once I started to get better and I was able to look back and read what I used to write about, I'm like, okay, Like, I'm not fully better yet, but I'm taking a step in the right direction. Like, it was really good to see that I was improving tiny steps at a time. Um, But yeah, writing, I'm very big on the meditating and the interior dialogue and stuff like that and changing the narrative. But those are are the two big ones, meditating and journaling. What about swimming? Um, um, (laughs) Erica, no, when he swims an event that's 15 minutes long, which is probably the length of my practice these days. Um, you saw events that are one and two hours long and, 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 and that's, that's a race far less your practice of six hours a day at times. Has that been helpful? A distraction both? I mean, how has swimming helped and have you, have you seen your struggles turn to strengthen the water and improvements? Yeah. So when I first had to go see a therapist, we decided to go see a therapist because it was affecting my practices. I couldn't finish a practice without having a panic attack. Hmm. So that's when we decided that I needed to start getting help. But uh, 
yeah, over the years, I've really learned to try to to be able to turn everything off in my head yeah. and just be able to do what I need to do. And honestly, that's been very helpful for what I do because, I mean, how many people can survive a five and a half hour race without being able to yeah. shut off their brain a little bit, you know? <laughs> uh, it's, it's been very helping. And it's also good to be able to shut everything off and kind of have swimming as an escape during yeah. all this stuff. We had George Bovell on and he was talking about that we are tree train ourselves to withstand pain. We literally do a set for those who are listening, which is teaching us how to deal with pain and still perform lactic threshold. But at the same part of the brain that deals with pain also deals with pleasure. So the more we train ourselves to stop the pain and to forget about the pain, it, it, it conditions ourselves not to be happy. And I often find myself in situations of thinking glass half empty. I'm like, yeah, but there's traffic. Should we really go see that movie? As opposed to, yeah, let's go see the movie. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's a big thing which we have to know, which is why we must train ourselves to, to be positive, to like every time something happens, celebrate it, celebrate the small things. So celebrate anything you just said, you know. Yeah, for sure. No, I get it. I feel like especially open water swimmers, we always say that open water swimmers all tend to get along so well because our minds are always a little bit twisted. Yeah. You know. It's like you got to be a little crazy to do open water. And so, yeah, no, we're, we're definitely a group of those people that like to intentionally put ourselves in quite a bit of pain and uh, for the pleasure aspect of it, not even in terms of just like the physical duration of the pain, but the physicality of it where people are throwing fists and grabbing your ankles and throwing punches and stuff like that. So no, yeah, I fully agree with that. But honestly, the thing with open water is like, there's nothing else like it. I, I just told my 11-year-old son that, you know, my guest today, she's a pool swimmer, an open water swimmer. He's like, I said, do you know what open water means? No. He said, well, anybody who's not in a pool, it's in a, you know, a river, a lake, or ocean. And she goes, isn't she in Las Vegas? I'm like, yep. <laughs> and, you know, that's a stereotype. You're in a desert. But do you just train in Lake Mead? Where do you train to do, or do you just do, like, five hours of pool swimming? What do you do for your training? Yeah. So we do we do a lot of Lake Mead. A yeah. lot of Lake Mead. Oh, especially during the pandemic. But uh, prior to that, we pretty much just took lane lines out of the water and oh. we swam in little loops. That was it. We changed direction every 20 to 30 seconds. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like we would have our pool and we'd put two buoys in there and it'd be around like a 75 with the, the loop that you end up doing. Yeah. Wow. And you just, you do loops and you you mimic situations. So you go, okay, group of three, group of four, group of five sprint to this buoy and pinch so-and-so off, fight so-and-so to the finish line. Like, yeah. you would just replicate drills. But honestly, like, the best learning curve I have from open water is just competing and doing yeah. the international competitions and trying to get as much knowledge as I can because open water is such a mind game and it's so strategical that you have to do those races to just, like, learn anything you can for them. It always seems like open water races, there's a lot of them that have a close finish. And it, that that just I don't, I don't understand it. it. It's like the the two hundred has become much more of a of a race against your peers than it is about just putting the blinders on and going fast in your lane. The four hundred even more so. Um, and you know, in those races, you'd think that you don't have to. As the distance goes higher, it seems like it's more and more just about playing to your competitors than it is about going as fast as you can actually go. Uh, but what's it like to be in a race that long and then be in a sprint finish? Yeah, well, sometimes it's just like there's nothing like the feeling of swimming a 10K and looking at the person right next to you and you're like, I am gassed and I know they have so much left in the tank. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever look at them and think I am gassed, but they're gassed too? Oh, yeah, that <laughs> happens too. But it's funny enough because – I want to say it was 2018 open water nationals and it was in Tempe, Arizona and Ashley had broken away and it was Haley. And I was right behind Haley. I was drafting off of Haley and I was like, I'm going to pass her. I'm going to make my move now. It's towards the end of the race. I literally like just broke away off of her body. I think I did two strokes and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to finish this race. Oh, yeah. And immediately proceeded to go right back behind her. And I was like, don't worry. I'm not going to fight you. I just need oh, wow. the help finishing. Like, that's oh, it. Wow. And we just had this, like, mutual understanding of, like, she's dead. I'm even more dead. So we're just going to – we're just going to – this is the way it was going to go. But, <laughs> yeah, no, there's – it's just a lot. It's because – and sometimes, yeah, you don't know how they're feeling. And some people just are even more gassed than you are. And you're like, well, what's happening to you? 
<laughs> like I've had races where I would touch the wall and my friend now, Kenzie McMahon, I ended up passing her towards the end of the race and I, I touched the chute and I'm getting ready to climb out and I hear the official scream like, we need a paramedic, we need a paramedic. And I'm like, I'm, I'm okay, guys. Meanwhile, Kenzie's in the chute like dead. She was dying, barely mm-hmm. holding on. And uh, I was like, oh, oh my God. Like Kenzie was not doing well. Little did we know during the race, she was fine. She's fine now, by the way, but in the moment, it was really shocking. So there's just so much that happens in open water. No, I mean, Brian, you lost a friend to, to that, um, um, tra- tragically. From, yeah, from that was the, so. Oh, yeah, Fran. I never met Fran in person. He was a little out of my generation, but mm-hmm. hearing stories from Ashley and Haley and stuff mm-hmm. like that is really cool. And his legacy lived on, and he honestly changed the sport of open water in terms of safety and rules that we follow now. So I like to think that uh, we made a lot of changes after what happened with Fran, but yeah, that was heartbreaking. And we've started to become, we started to reach a generation where a lot of young kids in the sport don't even know about Fran anymore. Cause mm-hmm. it happened in, I mean, what year was it? 13? Yeah. Was it 13? Um, no, it was while I was still swimming. So um, oh, wow. it had to have been 2010 or 11. Yeah, so yeah. like 2021 now, a lot of the a lot yeah. of 14 year olds did not even swim when Fran died. So yeah, like we're starting to hit a generation where a lot of them don't even know about Fran anymore, which is crazy. But yeah, yeah, that's 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 wild. Um, uh, do you do you ever think about uh, like I mean, so do you feel like the sport of open water is safe now, or is there still more to do? I mean. I think they do a really good job at making sure we're okay. Like just from hearing by the coaches, like how many lifeguard boats used to be on the dock, like out on the course with them when Fran was alive and like how many we have now are just like a night and day difference. We have like temperature limits of how hot the water should be unless we swim, if we're going to swim. Um, yeah, just more official boats out there. They've done a, a really good job. And now when I swim open water, I am definitely, I feel safer. I, I know that they will, if something were to happen, they'd be able to see me. But uh, I mean, at the end of the day, they can only see so much. So whatever happens underneath the water, anything goes. Mm-hmm. So in terms of like physicality, they can't really catch it all. But in terms of like safety and public decency for its athletes, they definitely have that. So how many punches have you thrown? Oh God, I've, I've done a few. <laughs> I do like the I do the swimming where I like take a stroke and then I like close my fist and I do like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> so I do that. Um, that's my go-to. If someone's on my feet, I'll do a little like breaststroke kick. <laughs> but uh, I tend to be the person who's like dramatic in open water, and if someone touches me too many times, I'll just like go. I'll like scream. I'm a screamer, so they will look at me and they know what's going on. I will not be touched anymore. <laughs> oh man i love it. that's my favorite thing so i do some triathlon and that's my favorite thing to do is just sit on people's feet because people like you get so pissed <laughs> <laughs> i scream bloody murder i'm like ah! <laughs> oh that's awesome you, you right. just mentioned the first two swimmers to make the u.s olympic team um were you in contention how did they select them how do you make the olympic team in open water <laughs> it's complicated it is a process that i still a lot of people need to explain it to me but basically okay. in 2019 in miami we had our open water nationals okay you had to get top two in miami i got third in miami uh and so basically from that spot you get invited to go to the world's team and so ashley and Haley were in place to qualify for the 10k and the 25k and you could you can swim both if you want to but uh obviously they just picked the 10k which <laughs> as they should as they should so then the 25k goes to the third and fourth spot if they both declined so then i got to go with the 25k so it kind of was like the consolation prize so i later. five and a half hours <laughs> later, very very long process oh my gosh but oh. yeah so then we get to korea and they had to get top 10 in korea that was like the big one. So if even though they got top two in the U.S., if they got 11th in Korea, they would not make the Olympic team. So we were and it was it was a tight race, like 
because there's no like set in stone touch pads uh mm. we all have the same touch pad a lot of it will be uh it'll say pf on it so we just we're seeing these names come on the screen and just says pf 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 and that stands for photo finish okay. oh so we 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 tried to count and we saw that ashley got sixth so she like got in there Haley was like second or third we saw Haley come in but it was like a breath holding few minutes to see if ashley or Haley got in and i am so glad i was able to see them make the olympic team because it was a cool moment the hype was there uh, are you uh, how did you feel yeah. after you came third in, in miami Bum, obviously <laughs> um i was i mean of course Haley yeah. and ashley are the best in the sport so it was great to be able to lose to them but it was a physical race. I remember that mm. one being physical, and I was upset because uh, Hannah Moore was in the race, and she actually got a red card because of physicality, and she was supposed to leave the course and never did. Huh. And, uh, yeah, and I was I was pretty upset about that because it was more so, yes. like, if the race was swam, like, legitimately, who knows if the outcome would have been different. But that was a grueling physical race. That one was a tough one. Um, but I was just being able to go to Worlds with them was pretty great too. Yeah, so I still wanted it for the day. Well, let's get to Sandpiper. What is Coach Ron doing with you guys in the water? It's it's incredible. You've you've had four people qualify, right? Yeah. Um, uh, a range of events. Um, I want to say um, five. I five we well, f- oh, well, Blake, yeah, five. Yeah, but Blake, Blake's never trained with us. So, so Bo yeah. and Bella, yeah. Katie, yourself. Right. That's that's incredible. What, what, what happened? I mean, you didn't have any loss on the pick round. It's been a while. What what, what the last four years? You had to Bo? Cody. Cody. Last one. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think we just all put in work. We all really work hard and Bo Bo was a sprinter doing distance practices when I was 14. Wow. I trained with Bo in the national group. And wow. honestly, he's a guy for stories, but that he got in trouble all the time for not being able to like finish practices he was struggling because we would do my yeah. first year was a lot harder than this year my first year we used to do i did 31 400s freestyle oh my gosh say that and again 31, <laughs> 31 400 freeze and why 31 did- that's gotcha why not 30 i don't know i don't know but we did 31 uh, extra one and well, there's no two workouts where we need to feed in the middle. Yeah, no feed. It was just a set. We just went for it. And oh. Bo did that set too. Bo is a hundred freestyler, and Bo did that set. Yeah. So Ron has really had the standard of like, yeah, you just throw down and do it. And honestly, like, Bo was a fast sprinter, but Bo was never Olympic level. He really wasn't. Yeah. And I remember Bo really struggled with college recruiting when he was going through it when he was leaving our program. And I know Ron had to call Minnesota. We were doing 3400s. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so Ron had to make a phone sprint. Call. Yeah, Ron had to make a phone call. He's like, I swear this guy is so much faster. He's just been doing horrible practices all his life. Oh my God. So they took a chance on him. And oh. But yeah, no, we put in work. We really put in work. Yeah. That sounds like it. That's crazy. Yeah, but I mean, come on, like, Ron's been doing it for so long. What's what's clicked now that suddenly Sandpipers? I mean, before Cody, I didn't know uh, I didn't know of Sandpipers, and then yeah. I felt like Cody, you know, was was the first prominent athlete. And then, of course, you had some folks like you know Blake and and both start to represent you know internationally. But like, or that's even more recent. Your success was was before that. So like, but what what is it that's really catalyzed it after Ron's been there for so long? <laughs> yeah, I think the recent success, it could be really anything, but I like to take pride, and honestly, if Ron wants to shut this down, he totally could, but I like to take pride in the fact that like I tried to create an environment, because I was pretty much the leader. I've been in the national group training with Ron for seven years now, so a lot of the young girls and a lot of people in the national group pretty much came into the team knowing that I was there, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I try to make it an active effort to create uh, a created environment that it was just like hard work was to be expected. Yeah. And it was like, you're going to throw down every day and you're going to give it your all because it was like, 
if I'm here for three years and I'm not in school and I'm training with you guys, like 15 year olds, you guys are going to put up a challenge for me. And like, that was pretty much the standard. And honestly, it's kudos to them for stepping up to it. Huge kudos to them for stepping up to it. And they did and they delivered and I'm glad it paid off for them just as much as me. But yeah, I really hope that once I leave Sandpipers in the fall, my legacy will continue on. They keep throwing down, but yeah, I cried about that on the last day of trials. A lot of the coaches were hugging me, and they're like, "You created something here." And I cried, and they cried. We had a lot of tears. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can clearly. You see the girls going through ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what, wait, what did you do to cultivate that, though? Yeah. Uh, you know, because that's 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 not really something that you can teach. That's clearly who you are, but um, it's also a different dynamic amongst a high school group as you're, you know, have kind of aged out of that and delayed your college career. Like that stature amongst a group of high schoolers is just, is so different. You know that you're looked at, you feel like you're being watched uh, every move that you make quite honestly, and you are. So like, what's your style with them? Yeah, it was it was hard because I am 20 and they are 15 and 16. So when mm-hmm. they first came to the group, I was 19, two years out of high school, and they were freshmen in high school. And I just remember the first training trip I went on with them. They were talking about how they were born in 2006, and that's the year I started swimming with sandpipers. And I quickly developed the nickname of Grandma, which was just <laughs> awful. Nothing like being 19 years old and getting called grandma. (laughs) But um, yeah, I think it was just them seeing me as like old and aged. And just, I think they had the youth in them to be like, oh, she's outdated. And they would try to beat me in practice every day. And me also being stupidly competitive was like, if you're going to win, you're going to have to earn it. So I would throw down a race here and there too. And we would, we would, we would fight to the death. We would throw down and we would race every day. So I'm glad that, you know, it clicked and it worked. But honestly, I see them all as, we call them the littles. I see them all as my little. So yeah, they're just, they're just kids. They're all little babies. And it's so interesting watching them grow up because like, I feel like 14 to 18 is just such a growth, detrimental time in human growth, especially for girls Mm -hmm. and seeing them grow up and experience their firsts and, learn all these new things has been really cool and it's been fun too how has it been to watch um katie make the team and see she she strikes me as um so mature but also so youthfully just jubilant um you know in 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 her press conference (laughs) and uh it's it's really interesting to watch but um she's a little too right yeah katie's a little um I think yeah Katie might be the most emotionally mature out of the squad um she's just she's very soulful so to speak but uh Katie's the wittiest I think Katie is really funny Bella but Katie tends to be a little more shy she's a lot more reserved than the other girls um Bella's the loudest Bella's very like outgoing and out there Ella, uh, Bella is very extroverted so much the p- fact that you have to kind of reel her in sometimes um yeah they all have their own little traits but uh honestly each like all their strengths really come out and they play it to the best of their abilities uh because of Katie's shyness I feel like her competitiveness is a little more low-key and she likes to keep it internalized a lot so she Katie is very hard on herself but since Bella is a lot more louder, she is uh, she's very openly competitive and she is she tends to throw down at practice and especially in the weight room. Um, and yeah, Bella will Bella will call Bella's kind of the leader of the pack. So Bella will call people out when they need to be called out. And then uh, in terms of me, nine times out of ten, I'm too tired to deal with all of them. <laughs> So I just left anything, <laughs> especially if it's like 15, you are grandma. <laughs> if it's fifteen-year-old drama stuff, I'm like, you know what, you guys, you guys, I'm out. I'm out, I'm done. So I tend to do my own thing, but I will definitely call them out when they need to be called out. If they're just being like dumb, I'll be like, you guys are stupid. Like, knock it off. Like, no one cares. 
you know what you do a lot of growing in you do a lot of growing in college and tomorrow's meg's last day at university um um you you're starting at texas in the fall yeah what yeah. what are you what are you hoping for and what are you looking forward to so i think the two are different but similar what are you hoping for and what are you looking forward to i am hoping for a fun environment of people my age to train with every day yeah i am very excited to have people my age to train every day at least for the i don't know how many years of eligibility i get so however much i get i'm excited to train with them but i'm also excited about really studying film i've been out of school of legit school for three years now i took ge's online but I'm really excited to study what I want to study. And I'm very excited to be able to study film and put a lot of energy and effort into that. I look forward to it a lot. I'm a filmmaker. I, 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 I didn't study much. The best way to study is get on set and start making shit. Just start making films. Just like, And you are. So talk about that. You're starting to dive in that career as well, which is huge. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, hey, I wrote my first, I finished my whole first completed movie screenplay uh, in the pandemic a few months ago. Wow. And I made my first short film in November. And honestly, my first short film was so freaking bad that I refused to let anyone see it. And that'll probably be the case for a few more after that. But I'm definitely excited to get better uh, and improve on that. But yeah, I'm excited for the connections that I get to make at Texas and hopefully get my foot in the door and meet some people and be able to, you know, really dive into that career and hopefully be successful. I would love to win an Oscar in my day. That'd be the dream. But yeah, I'm, I tend to I tend to be fairly extroverted. I like to meet people. So I'd love to build connections and create, create, create. And I think swimming is really hard to manage both, but we'll see how much more time I have in my film in my swim career. And once that's done, I'm going to be full gung ho filmmaker. That's for sure. South by Southwest right there. It's awesome. It's a dream. I love South by Southwest. Yeah, yeah it's wicked. There you go. Yeah. My favorite cans. If I could air a film at cans, that'd be the dream. Uh, easy. I had a dream to be on deck at the Olympics or be on stage at the Oscars. And, um, I'm still working the number two, but yeah, I think you're halfway there, which is pretty cool. So that that's sick, dude. So yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oscars would be dope. I, I for sure just want to tell stories. That's like a big yeah. thing, to me. and I love coming of age films and narrative filmmaking. So I am willing to do what it takes. And clearly, with how far I've gotten in swimming, I am one of harder workers in the world. So. I'm yeah. going to use the work I learned from swim to put it in the filmmaking. It's the hardest job in the world is filmmaking and to be on set, the dedication it needs. And then to do it well is to be authentic. And I see both in you. Uh, absolutely. So you have the passion, the love, the authenticity and the hard work. Mm -hmm. So you just need to have the right moment. For, sure. Yeah, For yeah. sure. Hopefully. yeah. Hopefully that pulls through. Hopefully yeah. Matthew McConaughey can hook me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right, Erica, we got some rapid fire questions for you to finish. Yeah, sick. What's the hardest race in swimming? 25K. <laughs> First time we said that. Olympic gold, Olympic gold, world record, or ISL MVP? Ooh. World record. In what event? Ooh, 1500 probably. Nice. Ooh. All right. Nice. Do you have a time in mind? Oh, that would have to be hard, but, and honestly, like, with Katie being so fast, I mean, it'd be like, I mean, it'd have to be sub 1520. So how, long, have, huh? how long until, how long until a woman goes under 15 minutes? I don't know. I don't know because her distance swimming, her stroke count has definitely taken another direction. I think she's a lot stronger in the four free and the two free and the eight free now more so than the mile so who knows now that she's not doing collegiate swimming anymore maybe greg can really like work on her stroke count but ooh, i don't see her going sub 15. i mean who we knows didn't ask her. we didn't ask her yeah yeah, yeah. Not, not her. Her. Any, any woman how long any woman, the any woman yeah. Is 15. Yeah. i don't know honestly i could see i don't know if summer mcintosh wants to make any big moves but six was fast yeah yeah if she can focus on the mile for a little bit i think yeah. she can throw down pretty well and i 
if Katie is taking Katie Grimes is mm -hmm. taking the the slope that she is making, I could see her hitting sub 15 too. But Jeez. it's I feel like since this is the first time we're seeing the mile in the games, I feel like in the next 10, 15 years, we're gonna see big gains in the women's like distance mm -hmm. field. Do reaction times matter for distance swimmers? <sighs> no. Come on, Ellie. I've gotten disqualified in the eight free at World Cup, and my reaction time was a 0.66. That was a false start. <laughs> Shoot, now 0.66. Rowdy says that's slow. Uh, <laughs> can you see the lap counters when they don't put them in the water? I hate it. Why is that a thing? Why is that a thing? I don't I know. Told people, they're like, what if you lose count? I was like, I'm going to do an open water stroke. So you don't lap count in Canada. You don't lap count in many countries. The U.S. loves lap counting. I need the lap counter. 30 is a big number. <laughs> you do, yeah, no, you do 31. Don't forget. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If there was a film about your life, what would the title be? Oh, God. We'll do We'll do my private Snapchat story name. It's called Rick Chronicles. <laughs> okay, I won't ask. <laughs> they say uh, keep Austin weird. What's the weirdest thing about Austin you're looking forward to? Ooh. Oh, man. Anything and everything, literally, yeah. like the drag queens, they have a lot of good yeah. drag queens. They live in Vegas, so yeah, that's very true. Drag queens everywhere. Uh, will you walk in the opening ceremonies? I want to, but I guess we'll have to see the schedule. I don't know what day I'm swimming yet. I think 1500 is later. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what, what will it take to medal in the 1500? I'm going to say, oof, I would say bare minimum is probably going to be like a 1543. Yeah. Okay. What did Tit must go? Did she swim the 15? No, because Maddie goes going. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. How do you say social kick in Japanese? Oh, God. It would probably just be like in Katagana, so it would be the same thing. Or you could say, like, talking kick. So it'd be like, shabiri kiku. I like that. Does Ron let you do that at all? Speak in Japanese? <laughs> do social <laughs> kick. <laughs> we do social kick. We do do social kick. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Erica, we look forward to watching you. You're super fun to hang out with. You're going to be an awesome addition to uh, this Olympic team and Team USA. So congrats. Thank uh, you. Great. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Yeah, that's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast, and we'll see you later. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick, and you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.